Welcome one to another edition of Playthrough Anonymous Edition is Armadillo, brought to us by IGS. Armadillo is an action platformer that's a little bit reminiscent of the likes of Super Mario Bros. 3. The game was released exclusively in Japan for the Nintendo Famicom, and was originally going to receive not only a North American release, but a sequel later on for the Nintendo Game Boy. For this run of the game, I am playing a fan-translated version of it, but you don't really need to know exactly what's going on in order to complete it. There's nothing particular about the dialogue or text in the game that will prevent you from being able to actually play through and complete it. So here we go with Armadillo for the NES, or Famicom. One of the coolest things about Armadillo is not only are you playing as an armadillo, which is really awesome, one of my favorite animals in the animal kingdom, but also the fact you get to turn yourself into a ball to bounce around, take out enemies, and get up the higher platforms. This takes a little bit of getting used to as far as the game's mechanics work. Momentum is a bit slow, especially at first. There's a lot of slowdown in the game, unfortunately due to the amount of enemies and the overall design of the game, which can get a little bit annoying as you're playing through, but once you kind of get the hang of how things work, how momentum works, and being able to get your character to land where you want it to, then things start to really pick up in the fun department. Each world of the game is broken up into kind of a board game-like setting, in which case you'll move Billy the Shell, aka the main character of the game, around the game board trying to get to wherever the boss is located. You'll clearly see on the map where the boss is located, and your goal is to of course run into him in order to initiate the boss battle for that particular world. He does move around the map and around the game board itself, and you kind of have to like track him down and corner him. Thankfully, the bosses are unable to go through areas that you've already completed, so anytime you've gone over a particular space or completed a particular level, they are unable to pass through levels you've already completed, so it's pretty easy to actually corner them. One of my only gripes though with the game is the fact that not only do you have to deal with the slowdown, but also they reuse parts of levels over and over again. On the main map of each particular world, you get the pictures of the levels before you enter into them, and levels that share the same picture usually end up having pieces that are identical to levels you've already thus completed. So it kind of makes the game have more levels than it really actually does because of this, but overall it's still a pretty fun, enjoyable action platformer to complete. Now right here I'm going to show you one of the kind of like celebrations of finishing up a level, but from here on out I'm just kind of skip these little cutscenes. They're kind of cute and cool, but you'll be seeing the same ones over and over again while completing levels. So just to speed things up a tiny bit, I'll skip them from now on, which thankfully you're able to do so. While the game does feature one hit death, there are a handful of power-ups or transformations that you're able to earn during the course of the game. There's a total of four of them, and I'll showcase at least one, maybe two of them during the course of the run. You have a bird form and a snail form, which I don't usually end up grabbing. The bird one allows you, of course, to fly briefly and be able to get up to some higher platforms that you normally wouldn't be able to reach. You have the snail transformation, which allows you to kind of crawl on walls, and then you have the fish, which will allow you to swim easier, though honestly, even without the fish power-up, you're able to swim pretty well. And then there's finally the kangaroo, which will allow you to kind of jump a little bit higher, and I usually end up getting that for myself pretty late in the game. Each of the levels broken up into multiple different areas for the most part, with a couple of levels only being one area. They range from mostly being left to right, though there is the occasional kind of level like this, where you're just kind of heading downwards. This at least changes things up and keeps it a bit fresh, though we'll be seeing still a lot of the same areas as we're traveling from level to level in World to World. Being in ball form is the safest bet for taking out not only most of the enemies, but being able to take damage from a lot of the enemies. There are a handful of enemies that can hurt you while in that ball form, as well as certain enemies that are instant kills if you hit them at the wrong spot. Over here we make it to the first boss battle of the game, and for this boss, and like many of the bosses, it's pretty simple, turning into the ball form and then just bumping into them three times in order to get rid of them. 
There's a couple of bosses that take more than three hits, mainly the final boss of the game and a boss that takes place about midway through the game, which is kind of an extension of the final boss as it is anyway. After completing a world, you'll get a little bit of text and like a note from the main enemy of the game, as well as your character saying, hey, I'm off to wherever the next place is located. The worlds in the game are based on real world locations, so we'll be heading to places like San Francisco, New York, Lima, Peru, and Mexico. And the game does a decent enough job with showcasing each of the worlds and some of the like unique characteristics that they would end up providing. My personal favorite probably ends up being Las Vegas, since of course it has a gambling theme to it, and I'm a big fan of casinos, so that's easily one of the cooler aspects of the game. There's even a slot machine for you to find during the course of some of the Vegas levels, and that will net you some bonus items and scoring and the like. One thing you've probably obviously noticed by now is at the end of every one of the levels, you have these switches, and whichever switch you end up hitting gives you a different amount of points. The points closest to the left side will give you less points than the ones on the far right. So theoretically, you would want to get more points, but for me, usually I like to get a little bit less points just to kind of speed up the process of counting up the points at the end of a level. Every 30,000 points that you earn in Armadillo, you will get yourself an extra life, so keep that in mind if you're trying to get the high scores. In this level, for the first time, we end up getting the apple, which ends up shrinking Shell down. In the smaller form, you're able to, of course, still move and bounce your way around, though you end up getting much bigger height in your jumps with the bounce, as well as there's a few things in the game, such as spikes, which you normally can bounce on in ball form, you won't be able to do so if you're miniature. If you go through like the big giant like funnel at the end of certain areas while small, it will make you end up growing again. You'll also enlarge if you end up losing a life or you end up completing whatever stage you ended up becoming small on. It's not necessary to become small. Sometimes there's a little bit of a benefit. You move a little bit quicker while you're small at some points and of course the much higher jump, though every level I think can be completed without ever actually becoming small. Also, always be cautious of the spikes. Like I said before, you can jump on them if you are in the ball form, but even if you, like, clip the side of a spike, it will still count towards your death. There's a couple of times where there may be spikes, like, above you on the edge of a platform, and if you jump into them without being in ball form, they will still end up hurting you. As you probably noticed in the first world as well, the boss of the level will move around, but since we can trap him easily, my goal usually is to beat the levels around him and kind of get him cornered to the point that I'm able to take him down that way. The hardest thing in the game, though, is purely getting used to the way that the momentum ends up working. There are so many times while I was playing through the game that my bounces ended up hitting like the wrong parts of platforms or edges or off enemies that I didn't want to hit and ended up sending me careening into a pit or other enemy nearby that ended up killing me. The big enemies, like the giant alligator above me, are one of the many enemies that can kind of like swallow you whole if you're not careful when going towards them. Here's another example of me getting over 30,000 points, now reaching over 60,000 points, and thus earning myself an extra life. Pelicans, watching out for them. They're another one of those enemies that have a big open mouth, so basically you could jump right inside of the mouth if you're not too careful. I also love the fact you can do wall jumping in the game. You can hang onto a wall and then springboard yourself off of it, though I do find it sometimes a bit of a nuisance as I'm trying to like quickly land on a platform and I end up hugging the wall and moving very, very slowly down the wall. After chasing the bad guy a little bit, I'm going to head over to this level here and just kind of keep him going. 
instead of like working my way around the map. This way you get to see another one of the levels here in world number two. And it's a pretty cool one as well because you're heading downwards. I love the giant bumpers. Uh, they will of course propel you depending upon which way you end up hitting them. But just a cool little thing that you'll see from time to time during the course of many of the levels. One thing that I don't like as much is the way enemies end up spawning. If an enemy is just off screen and like you're jumping, platforming, maybe like above you, an enemy can spawn and then respawn a few moments later uh, if you end up going off screen a bit. So this will cause some enemies to kind of fall down on top of you. So always be careful when going on certain platforms, like if you're going to be heading upwards, that there could potentially be an enemy that could drop on your head at any moment. And because of the bouncing in some parts when you go up and down bouncing, it can cause the enemy to spawn and then respawn and then respawn again and keep having them fall on your head, so uh, be careful of that. After cornering the boss here, we're going to head into the next boss fight, and this one is similar to the one that we had before, but be very careful at the beginning because there is a pit right next to the starting point. I actually had a couple of occasions where I accidentally fell into that pit at the beginning because I was holding right uh, to start momentum going and I ended up falling right in. Here we have a rooster, uh, very similar to the boss from the first stage. Uh, it takes a little bit, they will fire bullets, I mean, relatively slow. You just want to bounce on them three times, take them out, and now we're heading to the next world, which is the Las Vegas themed stage. So here we go, this is my favorite world, of course, of the game, because it's that Vegas theme. And we start off with a pretty basic desert-themed level to get us going, but then you'll notice that a lot of the other, like, level types throughout the course of uh, this world are staged around the whole gambling mechanic. And another thing that goes around with the whole gambling mechanic is the dice. You've probably noticed during the course of the levels, I've been picking up some random dice. You can hold up to five of them at a given time. At the end of a level, the dice are kind of tallied up, uh, and you're rewarded points for doing so. I think if you match certain dice, uh, like more of the same dice or, or whatever it may be, you may end up getting more points or potentially uh, get one-ups, though I never ended up getting one-ups directly. It was usually only from points. So it's just one of those things that is a cool little thing uh, to pay attention to, but honestly, it's just for points, it seems like. So for the most part, I just kind of get them if I run into them, but I'm not going to go out of my way to get any of the dice during uh, normal gameplay. So here we go at the first of the casino base style of levels. I love that you have like the uh, the chip dealer kind of standing uh, there in the background. Uh, I think that's the only like human that you really kind of see in the game. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic that it's a human in the background. So I guess the anthropomorphic animals uh, and humans kind of get along in this universe. Uh, as well as there are lots of playing cards around. You have the platforms at the tops of the playing cards, which when I first played the game a long time ago, I didn't even realize you could land on those. I had to kind of bounce around and finally bid. There's also a sushi sign, so I guess advertising like a sushi buffet. Uh, slot machines in the backgrounds. Uh, as well as a very annoying enemy in this particular world, and that is the coins. The, the, the dollar coins, because it's the dollar symbol and it's a coin, so I guess maybe they're silver dollars or whatever it's supposed to be. But the reason why they're annoying is every so often they throw out a little tiny bird from their top hat. And uh, the issue is the tiny bird can hurt you even in ball form. So you have to be very careful uh, when moving around the stage that you don't accidentally run into those birds when they end up throwing them out. That also may just be like a blackjack dealer instead of like someone who's going to divvy out the, uh, the chips and the like. But still just interesting dynamic of having the human. Uh, if you notice the kind of like starry door in the levels like this, those are the ones you can go into in order to do the slot machine little mini game uh, where you can potentially earn some more points and the like. There's some flippers, so you have like a pinball theme kind of thing going. I guess they combine like all kind of gaming uh, into one as far as the Vegas levels were concerned, but still kind of cool to see. Here's an example, I'm going to try to get this boss to kind of maneuver a little bit, sending him over to the uh, far left side. I'm sure uh, if you did a little bit more manipulation, you could probably end up getting to the boss pretty quickly. I'm not sure if there is any speedrunners out there who have attempted to speedrun good old Armadillo, but if there is any, uh, I'm sure there's ways to manipulate the bosses to get to them a little bit uh, quicker. 
This stage is a bit unique that it's pretty much just having you go down. There's enemies on each floor, some of the dollar coins, uh, some of which are like the prairie dogs that end up saying bow for their weapon. An interesting enemy. Because I assume that's what they're supposed to be, is like some sort of like prairie dog, so, you know, they're saying bow as in bow wow, but... Uh, you may have also noticed that little octopus that was hanging around, and I will end up getting him later on in the game, uh, but the octopuses, if you run into them at any point, they're even featured on the cover of the game, are outer space octopus? They are space squids or space octopi? I'm not sure what they exactly are, but if you talk to him, he will actually offer to let you use his UFO, and his UFO will then, after talking to him, will be stationed in the level itself, usually right around from where you ended up talking to him. And if you get into the UFO, uh, you'll complete the level automatically that you're on, and then get the opportunity to go anywhere on the map to the next level you want to, though unfortunately, you cannot initiate the boss encounter. This would allow you to easily skip uh, entire worlds just about by getting to it if they're, you know, one of the levels with the UFOs, go there, immediately grab the UFO, and then head right to the boss. So you're not able to do that with it, so one of the reasons why the UFO really isn't all that useful, uh, but still kind of a little cool, interesting other thing that's kind of thrown into this very obscure, weird platformer. It just has so much going on that it just oozes charm with its enemy types and just the things in the backgrounds and the level designs, uh, but just isn't perfect with the momentum and a little bit of the reusing of certain level types and the like, but still such just an interesting, cool game. Time to move on, though, to the next boss encounter. Uh, this one is another one that's very similar to the ones we've been dealing with, though at the beginning you start off by falling all the way down to the bottom. Be careful, though, because there is a ramp that could potentially send you into a pit. Here you're fighting a pig. This boss battle is pretty much the same as the last ones. We're just going to get him to a corner real quick, bounce on him several times. You do have to be careful, though, if you do a higher bounce and, like, hit off of his head, any of the boss's heads, uh, they could send you flying into the opposite directions or away from the boss, in which case you may fall into a pit nearby. So you do have to be a bit careful, but overall the bosses are relatively simplistic with mainly the only the final boss and the giant robot boss that we'll be fighting in a little while uh, are the only exceptions really to that rule. Next up though we're heading to San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, an interesting kind of another level set up for everything. Uh, but still similar designs to other stages that we have been seeing uh, throughout the course of the game, at least up to this point. Here I pick up the fish power-up. Now this is the ability that will allow me to turn into a fish. Uh, if you end up getting more than one of the same transformations, uh, you'll instantly get a one-up. So if I have the fish transformation and I get another fish transformation power-up, I'll end up getting a one-up. Uh, you keep the power-ups until you end up losing them, until you end up getting hit uh, by an enemy. Well, I'm not really using it in this level because I want to showcase like swimming, just how it normally is, and I'll be using it in the other levels, and you can see that having the fish ability doesn't really add all that much of an advantage underwater, at least from what I can tell. I like this part here where we have to watch out for the bat, but you have like all these little like ramps and stuff. You can do some a lot of fun stuff in this game by just rolling into the ball and just having fun in levels. Spend time messing around if you want to. You can probably just, uh, you know, have a few, you know, a few minutes, a few hours maybe of even fun being stupid in this game from time to time because of just the way that the levels are designed overall. The next level I'm doing is a San Francisco themed stage, though a little bit questionable as far as the overall design. I don't think they quite nailed it as well as they ended up nailing the uh, Las Vegas levels, but you guys be the judge of that. Do you think the levels properly represent uh, San Francisco in these particular stages? These levels also end up having a very similar feel to the New York style of levels that we end up seeing late in the game. In fact, the last world of the game is the San Francisco theme stages. Watch out for the bull that comes charging down this hill. Thankfully, just being in ball form uh, is enough to uh, stave off his uh, powerful charge there. And then next screen, while well, you have a giant ladder, you don't really have to take the ladder upwards. I don't know why they kind of like set that all up uh, for you to kind of go up, but I mean, you're really going to need to go right and over to uh, this way here in order to get to the goal. Right afterwards, we go into another one of the San Francisco-themed levels. 
this one that has a couple of uh, enemies right near the very beginning, the giant pelican, more bulls charging their way through San Francisco. I'm sure that's just a regular day occurrence, just charging, charging down the streets of San Francisco, giant, giant mad bulls. The next screen has a couple of the pinball flippers that will send you flying, of course, when you land on them. Being careful to kind of slide down just enough so I can get momentum to be able to jump in the air and avoid the enemy here. I didn't want to stay in the ball form and end up rolling into him and end up falling down below into the pit. And same kind of similar deal that you have to deal with here, where there's a big, pretty big open gap of possibility to fall down, uh, especially if you're, you know, bouncing everywhere with the ball form. Right after that, though, we have another one of these giant ladders, similar to the one we climbed up earlier in the game that had the bat, and now we kind of go down these slopes. Like I said, a lot of fun to do this, but this is where you start to see a little bit more of the repetition of some of the level design, so I really wish they would have flushed things out a little bit more. Maybe just a little bit less levels overall, but more original stuff uh, in the end. Next up is a water-themed level, or at least a partially water-themed level. I do kind of like the minty, bluish-green color scheme uh, that's going on here. And not long after the very beginning, we end up into a nice uh, little thing of water that we have to kind of maneuver our way around. Here, I'm going to use the fish ability for the first time and start making my way downwards. Like I said, you can swim with the fish form, so you have a little bit, I guess, better maneuverability than just swimming normally, but it really gets slight. Uh, it really kind of just works, though, as an extra hit that ends up helping more than anything else. Because if you end up getting hit while transformed, you just end up losing that form instead of losing a life like you normally would end up doing if you were just, like, in your regular armadillo form. It can be difficult sometimes to get the right bounce in order to make it up to this door. And there's also a few times in the game where I have issues with the doors. Like, they don't quite work every single time as I'm trying to enter them, which can sometimes get a little bit annoying, especially if I'm trying to go through the areas quickly. But uh, if you make it to one of those doors and it doesn't work, just keep kind of maneuvering back and forth and keep trying it. Eventually, the door will end up working. Next up, we go into another water level, and it starts off identical to the last one, though the color scheme is different, at least. Uh, but it's pretty much the same exact pattern that we're going to take through the stage, turn into the fish here, and kind of swim our way around several of the enemies uh, throughout the course of here. Uh, though it's, like I said, unfortunately, it's the same exact design that we just completed just a few moments ago. We go back to that minty blue-green color scheme here, as well as I pick up an extra life at the beginning of this area. It's like a weird square with a circle in it. I don't know if it's a belt buckle or a mirror. I'm sure I'm completely off with it. You guys let me know down in the comments what that instant one-up is actually supposed to be, at least. This area, though, very simple to get through and completing the level, moving on to the next stage, which thankfully is a little bit different in setup. Now this is an example, uh, once again, of I could actually go back around the map the way I came and not go through this level, but I just wanted to showcase another stage in this world uh, before moving on. Up the top of these stairs here, we could turn small if we wanted to, it would help us maneuver a little bit, uh, but stay in the ball form uh, as much as you can just to make sure the bowl ends up passing over your head, and then jump over to the far right where you'll find yourself the door and head inside this little cave area. I love the cactus enemies. They're kind of like adorable as they kind of like dance back and forth uh, as they're making their way around. I also find it interesting though that they have like planets in the background of this cave area, giving it an interesting look overall. I'm not sure exactly what they were going for here. I picked up one of the upgrades, the shoes, which allow you to move faster for unfortunately though only the level that you're currently in or until you end up uh, losing a life. I wish you could get like a permanent speed upgrade. That would really increase the playability of the game. I think overall, just the increased speed of shell
sell uh, would be humongous uh, as far as the overall gameplay goes. Now, when we go into the next boss encounter, we actually have a little cutscene before the boss ends up beginning. Here we get to fight Mega Fat Modillo. Fat Modillo, the main boss of the game, who's kidnapped Shell's girlfriend. Uh, he has a giant mecha version of himself. You can hit it anywhere with the ball form. He'll shoot out a giant missile from his stomach. Uh, watch out for that, and then after that goes away, he'll then fire out bullets straight out in a three-shot spread shot. So be far enough away from him so that you can pass easily between the bullets and then repeat hitting him. It only takes uh, five hits, a little bit more than the average boss in the game. And then we are moving on to the next level, which is Mexican-themed. Be careful early on in the stage because there are a few pits as well as you have that bumper that could end up bouncing you uh, directly into one of the nearby pits. Anytime you see breakable blocks in the game, if you're looking for one of the power-ups, uh, usually are going to be contained within these along with those little gift boxes that you see like the one that's right near me up here. So if you want to rely a little bit more on trying to get the speed up boots or more points or extra lives, plenty of breakable blocks everywhere in every level, some of which you can't even tell they're breakable blocks until you end up running into them uh, in order to pick up plenty of that stuff. You'll notice there's a lot of temple-themed stages here in this world, which makes perfect sense here, and end up working pretty cool. That at least gets to change some things up, have some nice designs to them. I also like the blue color scheme uh, on the platforms themselves. Be careful when we drop down here, because there is the big ramp that could send you potentially into a pit. I love a bar that's just kind of like hanging out here in the uh, bottom portion of this temple stage. And then we're going to use some nice giant bounces in order to get high enough to get to the door on the right side. Once in here, be careful that you're not holding left on the D-pad right when you transition because you may end up falling into that pit right nearby. And then we're going to make the jump over here and start bouncing our way up to the top here by going through a series of small openings. You can pick either the left or right side, whichever side you prefer, but either way is going to lead up to the very top where we run into another door. Once going through, watch out for the bat and the spikes here. You can bounce off of the spikes if you need to uh, in order to get high enough up in order to reach the goal. To keep things at least a little bit fresh, we'll go to one of the water-themed stages next. You can see the big set of water to the right of the platforms as we bounce our way up to the portion here and switch over, uh, over to our fish form. You do have to be careful, though, of the spikes that are lining the ceiling here. Like I said before, if you run into them, even from the side, they can still end up damaging you. So try to do your best to keep away from running into them in any way. Once you bounce out, just jump over to the right side. There is a box if you want to grab that present, but our goal is going to be hitting this door. Go right on through and then turn into the fish and start heading upwards through this next series of pathways. A pretty easy, very straightforward area for you to go through. There are a few enemies, there's some spikes lining the floors and ceilings once again, so you don't want to go too fast through, but just maneuver around and you'll easily come to the goal at the end and moving on to the next stage.
You can see because of the way that this world map is designed, it's a little bit hard to kind of trap the boss, so we do end up having to complete quite a few stages uh, during this world. The next up is another temple-themed level, but what's cool is they designed it a little bit differently. It's actually an outside temple-themed level. Pretty basic, though, overall. Plenty of, like, little ramps here and platforms for us to make our way. There's a couple of ways you can kind of travel through, either going, like, the upper path or the bottom path, finding an extra life here from this present before heading through the door to the next area. Right as soon as you enter, there's a couple of skunks, which I love the skunk enemies, them walking on their front paws, like doing a handstand, slowly trying to come towards you. They don't actually spray you or anything, which would have added a little bit of interesting uh, mechanic to them uh, overall, but still, pretty cool sprite. Uh, and then we're gonna head up all the way to the top, to the upper right corner, going through the next door. Now here, be very careful when you make this jump over to the right. There's a couple of enemies floating above, which if you end up running into the rudder of these flying fish things, that will end up hurting you no matter what. Here I also find the snail power-up, though I'm not gonna be grabbing it or using it in this case, and eventually getting over to the goal. So you wanna be careful of the flying guys as well, as there are some spikes in the area. After maneuvering the boss a little bit, we're gonna head into this level here, another one of the desert-themed levels. Watch out for the clouds that are crying, spitting, other things, but either way, there's water droplets coming down. They have a pretty weird smile on their face as they're doing so. There's a very small pit you can potentially fall down if you're not careful uh, with the ball ability right there. But right on the next screen, we're gonna grab a speed power-up to kind of move a little bit quicker uh, through this area. But we have to kind of do a lot of bouncing and manipulation in order to kind of move up through this small little corridor set here. Either way, once we make it over to the top, we're going to head over to the far right side where we make it to the goal of rather simplistic level. Now we're moving on to one of the other temple-themed levels, and this is another one of the outdoor-themed ones, heading up the ladder right near the beginning. Be careful of the couple of enemies right at the top here, but either way, we're going to climb up the next ladder right after that, and then maneuver around the very small individual platforms. Make a big, giant leap over to the right where we can hit these ladders and find our way to the door. Once inside, bounce up and be careful of both the flippers as well as the bumper. Here, if you hit the flipper at the wrong spot, you may hit the bumper, and it may end up sending you flying right directly down the pit. So usually I like to jump at the bumper itself, hitting off the top, top right of it, in order to springboard myself over. Here I pick up the invincibility potion, or drink, or vase, or whatever it's supposed to be. Either way, it becomes invincible for a small period of time, as well as also getting shrunk down by one of the apples. So kind of humorous to finish up the level, both small, and invincible making us blue, as well as taking out an enemy while we do so as well. Thankfully, we have the boss trapped, so we're going to easily be able to get to where he is and head into the boss encounter here. Now, this boss goes back to the more traditional bosses that we've been dealing with throughout the course of the game instead of, like, the giant robot. The hardest part is actually the very beginning, trying to get over all the very small platforms. When you make it to the right, though, it's time to battle this fox guy. We're just going to bounce on his head three times like always, just being careful not to fall down the left or right sides of the big open pits. Once it's taken care of, we are moving on to the next world, which is supposed to be Lima, Peru, but along the way we end up crashing in our plane and end up in the Amazon. This level and world is a little bit more straightforward than the previous one, starting off with you having to do this initial stage. I do like the overall look, though, to the level here. You have a really cool jungle-themed, uh, like, village-themed area that we get to uh, enter in. And uh, overall, just a nice little change of pace uh, as we make it farther into the game here. On the second screen, we're going to watch out for a couple of skunks that are hand standing their way over. You have this big giant guy. Of course, be very careful of him. Only hit him the opposite end of his mouth. You want to hit him in the tail, of course, so you don't end up uh, being swallowed whole by him and end up losing a life.
After completing that level, we're moving on to one of the underwater themed levels. Start off by dropping on down into the green water. That doesn't really look too uh, appealing here. But we can use the fish ability in order to kind of maneuver our way through the green slimy water. Gonna stop being the transformation for just a moment in order to kind of get our way through this little area. And then continue on to the right being careful of both the enemy above us and of course the spikes lining the walls here. Just a little bit farther in, you'll come to the door, which, because of the way the color schemes work in the game because of the limitations, you end up having a green color inside of the door. Right after that, though, right here is one of those areas where enemies can spawn and respawn and respawn as you're bouncing, so be careful, stay in the ball form as you work your way up that left wall there. It can also be a little bit hard to kind of manipulate and move your way around here, but, but after getting through that and then another small area with a few small platforms, you'll hit the goal. Now here I'm going to go right into the next of the underwater themed levels. Thankfully it doesn't start off exactly the same like we have seen in some stages in the past. Start off by bouncing along the spikes here, staying in the ball form so that way we don't accidentally get clipped even by the sides of the spikes while going in between. We also don't want to drop down into the water below, you want to use the bumper in order to spring your way over to the right side and get to the door in the right corner. That will lead you right to another screen. Now this one is similar to the second screen that we dealt with in the last level, so be sure to stay into the ball form in order to bounce your way up this wall and then into the area with all the very small platforms. I'm going to go up here and take the spikes path this time in order to make my way over, but either way, the exit or goal is in the same location. Now after manipulating the boss around a tiny bit, heading into this next level, another one of the village themed levels, start off with a similar area to be dealt with in the first village themed level of the uh, Amazon world here. Gonna do a nice little sliding ball jump over to the right, though I have to be careful of one of those silver dollar like enemies that's gonna be trying to take me out with one of his bird friends. In order to make it over this gap here, we have to do a kind of a big bounce in this kind of like half circle, and that'll allow us to get enough momentum over to the far right side where we'll be able to go here. Now, for this level, what I'm going to do is just showcase the UFO. I will have to beat the other level that's where the boss is currently located because we can't go right into the boss fight, but this way you guys get to see the UFO and what it ends up doing. After talking to the squid guy, we have to head up here, and you can see that the UFO is waiting for us in the air. It's kind of a cute little design there for it. And like I said before, you can kind of go anywhere on the map, but you can't go right into the bosses, which is one of the only negatives. So we'll have to go to this level instead and complete this, and then we'll be able to take out the boss. Started off by heading down. A lot of slowdown with a lot of enemies here. There's a lot going on on the screen at this point, but we're going to use a couple of big bounces in order to get our way through the middle portion of this area. Falling down, being careful of some spikes, but if I hug the right wall, I can land on this set of icy platforms and then get down here into the right side where I'm going to bounce up, staying in ball form. That way I can avoid the enemies. As you can see, that one enemy just keeps spawning and immediately dropping down. That's just a problem that ends up happening uh, in this spot and in a few other spots as well throughout the course of the game. After getting past that little spot though, I'm able to bounce up to the uh, ice platforms up at the top here and then come on down to the goal. Now the boss for this world is this hippo guy who actually works a little bit different 
than previous bosses. The hippo, when you hit him, ends up going back and forth on the bottom portion of the platform and then springs back out. You can't hit him when he is down below the ground level, but you still have to just take him out with three hits, and then you can move on to the next world, which allows us finally to make it to Peru. Not sure how many games out there even have a level based around Peru, but kind of a cool little thing. Though it doesn't really change up the overall design of the stages we're going to be dealing with. I like the whole Nazca lines uh, kind of setup, at least for the picture. At the portion here, I'm going to shrink on down. This is going to allow me to make a couple of bigger jumps here on the top portion, instead of even going through the little smaller area. Have to be careful, the big giant guy who's going to try to eat me here before entering inside, which takes us inside of a cave-themed area. A little bit of a tight space, though, as we have to bounce our way up through the platforms, taking out a few enemies. Just be careful of the potential Bow Wow attack that they could end up doing against us as we work our way up. Once we make it up past a couple of monkey-like enemies, we just have to make it up one more big jump and make it to the goal. As you can see, because of the world design, you do have to complete two levels in a row before you can then kind of get a little bit of movement on the map. The next world of the game, which is the final world that we'll be going to, uh, is a complete straightforward linear world that you have to complete every one of the levels in it in order to eventually reach the final boss of the game. Starting off this level, we're heading to the right. You can shrink down and go inside this area if you want to, or you can take the upper path, bouncing along the walls, and use the ball formation, and this allows us to kind of do a little bit of a shortcut. I think it's a little bit quicker to just kind of bounce your way up. Right after that, though, we have another segment here, and I'm going to take the upper path again by using a couple of big bounces in order to make it up to the top, and thankfully, these bounces allow me to easily traverse this top area. Here we have a flipper, which will end up sending us over to the far right side, and as long as I don't hit any of the bats or other enemies, I land safely on the goal at the very bottom. Here we're going to be heading up using a couple of like the ramps and a few big bounces. Nothing too uh, spectacular about this uh, particular area, though there is another bar just kind of hanging out here in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And I guess and I guess it's a desert themed level, so it's just kind of hanging out in the desert. We've had bars inside of temples, caves, and bars inside of the desert just kind of sitting around. Here, if you run into the statue, it will end up slowing you down briefly. It's kind of weird. There's not a whole lot of them in the game. Uh, also, be very careful of the spinning enemies right there. I think they're clowns, spinning clown enemies. But if you hit pretty much any part of the spinning, they will end up hurting you, even if you are in your ball form. So, just be cautious about that. Before we reach the end, there is a little bit of small platform, so you have to be cautious, but either way, make it to the goal and moving on to the next level. Here I'm going to head straight on down, this way I kind of trap the boss where I kind of want him to go. And we have a cool level here where it's just a series of ramps, and we can roll down all the way if we want to. Uh, but I kind of like mix it up, roll for a little bit, get a little bit of speed, then go out of the ball form. You just want to be careful when you uh, make it uh, a little bit that you don't end up coming out of that form right on top of one of the enemies. It's a really short level though, the only difficulty really is the very end of it, the very bottom, there's a couple of little pits. But more often than not, you're going to easily safely land on the switches.
After manipulating the boss and getting him kind of trapped, we enter into the next boss fight. This one starts off similar to one earlier, but there's no pits around, so you can fall safely down to the bottom. And here you have a giant bird. He will fire out projectiles that can be difficult to dodge out of the way out because of the way they kind of explode into the spread shot around. But three hits, and he ends up going down, and we're moving on to the final world of the game, the New York themed stage. Like I mentioned earlier, the New York theme stage is one that you have to complete every one of the levels in order to make it to the boss. The first one starts off with one of those rotating clown guys, and you can see that the level design is similar to the level that we saw earlier on in the San Francisco themed worlds. I also make the same exact mistake I made during that, that I start heading this way, before eventually realizing, oh yeah, I forgot, I actually am supposed to head all the way up. When you're going through this little small area, be careful of this guy, because if his mouth is open, you will end up instantly dying if you run into him. But you can stay in the ball form and just roll into him once the mouth closes in order to take him out. The second portion of the level is a more colorful, carnival-esque themed level here with some stars in the background, some balloons, a little bit more of a happy feeling. There's even like kind of a weird carousel looking thing kind of going on. Make a big, giant leap over a couple of pits in a row. There are a few sets of spikes, so you also have to be careful about them as we make our way over. Here, you have another one of those bumpers, but we make a nice time to bounce and can get completely over the bumpers without even having to worry about them. Drop down while hugging, of course, right on the D-pad so you can easily land safely, and then a couple little more jumps until we make it to the goal. Next up is one of the directly carnival themed levels here, and this one starts off, we're going to have ourselves jumping up, you can see the nice like pink and light pink platforms that we're going to be uh, bouncing our way through. The clown guy gets on my nerves here, but thankfully we can kind of like despawn him by him going upwards, and that way we can safely uh, traverse this area without him running directly into us. Here we're once again going to do a nice little bounce, I barely make it past him, and at the very top we have a nice little sushi restaurant, just kind of sitting here, hanging out, lots of sushi places, as well as the bars, just in weird locations throughout the course of Armadillo. Now, this is one again, it's a spot where you could shrink on down and go through if you want, but I'm just going to do a couple of bounces and I will end up landing on top and slide my way through. The area isn't necessarily very long as far as like overall size, but it takes a bit to kind of maneuver all the round here. Drop on down, be careful of the bumper so you don't end up getting into one of the pits or bouncing upwards back towards the spikes, and then head through the door. In the next area, you'll notice some giant letters that end up spelling out IGS, which is, of course is the name of the developer of the game, but then we make it to the goal. Right into the next level with more carnival theme. There's a couple of propeller fish guys, so you want to make sure that you're careful of them. Unfortunately, I missed time a jump, so I end up falling into the pit and end up losing a life. But thankfully, it was right near the beginning of the level, so we're going to get right back in. And you kind of just have to, like, make the jump timed correctly. As long as you don't hug the wall right there and you're, like, not sliding on it, you'll have enough momentum to clear it. You'll, like, kind of bang your head a little bit, but you'll land safely on that platform. The second part of the stage is a, another one of the casino-based little areas, so I'm glad they brought back this whole kind of stuff. Uh, there's no gambling, though, the slot machines and the like, I don't think, in New York, especially not when this game came out. But um, maybe this is like some kind of underground casino uh, that we're working our way through here. Up here, we have a couple of spikes, but also more letters that end up spelling out the word bar. So not only do we have bars that uh, are just kind of in the middle of nowhere, we also have letters that spell out bar. Bouncing our way, breaking some blocks, watching out for a few enemies, and hitting the goal at the bottom.
down to the final three levels of the game, and these are all based around, like, the New York-themed stages. Uh, these are kind of, like, run-down streets a little bit. There's, like, some graffiti on the walls, and also provide a decent challenge as far as the overall platforming is concerned in the game. Some spikes set up in some odd places that you can accidentally slide into as you're trying to make it through, as well as quite a few little pits that are very easy to accidentally bounce your way inside of. Here, bounce your way up here and land on the single platform. You can turn small if you want to, but we're not going to go through the small entrance way. Instead, we're going to head all the way down to the bottom here and bounce our way through here. There's one of those vases, so I can become invincible for a period of time here. But what's cool is, in the invincibility form, you can walk on spikes. The issue is, when you're small, you can't bounce on spikes, even if you are invincible. So keep that in mind. If you're invincible and small, you can walk on spikes, but you can't bounce on spikes. I don't know why there's that discrepancy there with that, but that ends up being the case. Either way, in the next area, pretty straightforward. Just a few little small jumps and the switches at the end. As the next area begins, we do have to shrink on down, and this will allow us to maneuver right through the little opening here, and we're going to start heading upwards here. In the middle area, you're going to head up to the right, jump up on top of the small slanted platform, and then through this small corridor, making the jump so that you're able to make it all the way through to the very end and reach the door. In the next area, we're going to stay small here, and now we're going to jump over to the right side here where these spikes are. You want to get past the spikes and jump safely over. You don't want to head up. Uh, it's just going to end up leading to a dead end. Here, you have to bounce your way up, and we're going to jump through the floor here. I think if you bounce, you can end up breaking a couple of these platforms. That's what I've noticed in the game. Like, if they are breakable a lot of times, you can actually just kind of jump through them. But either way, that's what we have to do in order to get ourselves upwards. Using this bumper to kind of spring our way over, being careful of the bat as I almost ended up running into it. And going through this funnel, which will allow us to grow and hit the next door. Thankfully, another very easy area to finish up the stage, just more of the letters that end up spelling IGS before we hit the switches. Onwards to the final level of the game before the boss encounter. This area is similar color scheme to one of the areas we saw a little bit earlier with the red bricks in the background, but it's similar in design to the other New York themed levels where we have a lot of these slanted small corridors that we have to make our way through. Also, plenty of oddly placed park benches that are set up throughout here as well. Be careful sliding downwards here because you do have an enemy on the left that will fire out and you may accidentally like bounce off the monkey guy and end up bouncing right into the projectile. Head up the small little passageway here and bounce your way all the way up to the top and past the ice blocks to a door that's kind of just sitting there on a small platform. Right after that, you have a couple of the skunks just kind of walking on their hands. Use the spikes here in order to bounce your way up. As long as you're in ball form, like always, you won't be hurt by the spikes. Up at the top here, we're going to watch out for a couple of birds and then jump on these small little columns in order to kind of get over to the right. Hugging this wall will allow us to just barely land on the icy platform below. Now, we're not going to hit the bumper. Instead, we have to bounce our way up in order to reach the next door. Hitting the bumper will just send us into the pit to the right there. For the next area of the stage is an outdoor themed area. I end up picking up the kangaroo power up. I do actually like the uh, sprite that is used for the little kangaroo power up. And here you go, you can see it briefly there. There's nothing too overly special about the kangaroo power up, but if you end up getting it, at least it's another free hit if you decide to kind of hang out for a bit of time in the uh, whole uh, kangaroo power up mode. Once the level is complete, though, it's now time to move on to the final boss of the game.
Now the final boss is very different from other bosses that you can't hit him a lot of time. In fact, what you have to do is wait for him to go into his ball form, in which case he will bounce around into one of the many openings that you have to be careful you don't fall down into as well. And then he'll start keep spinning over and over again, bouncing a little bit until he runs out of momentum, and then he ends up on his back. This allows you to have the vulnerable spot on him to hit him in the stomach in your ball form in order to hit him and do damage. He'll then turn red, moving himself back and forth around, eventually doing kind of a rotating spin move. You won't be able to hit him during this, and as long as you've kept your distance, he won't be able to come towards you. Overall, while this is technically the most challenging boss in some regards in the game because of its length and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to uh, hit him, overall it's still a really easy final boss as far as uh, platformers are concerned. Though I absolutely love the fact that it's a fat armadillo just named Fat Madillo. Like, that's just probably the absolute greatest part of this entire experience. Once you hit him with the final blow, you can sit back and enjoy the ending to Armadillo on the Famicom. So there you have it, Armadillo for the Famicom, a platformer that unfortunately never made it to North America. I feel with a little bit of polish and uh, a few little tweaks here and there, it could have been an absolutely great platformer. It's still a little bit of a hidden gem as far as import gaming goes uh, for the system. Uh, this game was at one point turned also into one of those Mario bootlegs, starring of course Mario instead of Shell the Armadillo. I think most of the game remains largely intact though from that version though. It's been a long time since I've messed with that particular bootleg, but I remember being one of the earlier Mario bootleg style of games I ended up seeing. The game is developed by AIM, and unfortunately there wasn't a lot of other games they ended up doing. They actually did do a couple of license-based games that came out to North America for the Super Nintendo, including the Inspector Gadget game and SWAT Cats, though we didn't end up seeing any sort of sequel to Armadillo. After our main hero gets a kiss from his girlfriend that he saves, we then have a pink heart over her head and an end in the corner, signifying the end of our armadillo adventure. But with that, guys, also, that's going to wrap up this episode of Play It Through. I'd like to thank you for watching, and of course, I hope you enjoyed.